Look, but don't touch. Touch, but don't taste. He's a sadist. He's an absentee landlord. Worship that never. I'm a humanist. Maybe the last humanist. Al Pacino playing a humanist and a lawyer. That's the classic legal film, The Devil's Advocate, which is now marking its 25th anniversary at a time when law seems to be a nearly constant source of fixation and debate in our politics, our national culture. Lawyers keep emerging as key characters in the clash over Trump's failed coup and the future of our democracy. Pacino plays a scheming lawyer using his knowledge of the rules to break them. That may echo lawyers like Giuliani and cool plotter John Eastman, both under investigation for committing crimes themselves. Then there are the other lawyers who stepped up as the people who tried to hold the line against that coup. Some of the most vital damning testimony about Trump's attempts to overthrow the election and to support the insurrection came from lawyers. Government lawyers at the White House, lawyers for the vice president, who tried to, they say, act as shepherds of the law in those roles. Which brings us to this classic archetype. In The Devil's Advocate, you have Keanu Reeves playing the everyman trial lawyer who believes it's possible to play by the rules without losing your soul. I don't like Alexander Cohen. I don't think he's a nice person. But this isn't a popularity contest. It's a murder trial. And in the film, that lawyer's approach is tested when he goes and joins a fancy Manhattan law firm headed by Al Pacino's John Milton, who turns out to be evil. And not just like a bad lawyer, but actual evil in the sense that he is the literal devil. He killed those people. You really believe that? He set me up. Set me up, Melissa. The whole thing. I, I know it. Gotta go with your gut. I don't like it here, Kevin. These women. My God. I mean, I'm seeing things for Christ's sake. Free will. It's like butterfly wings. Once touched, they never get off the ground. No. I only set the stage. You pull your own strings. I don't lose. I win. I win. I'm a lawyer. That's my job. That's what I do. Who in their right mind, Kevin, could possibly deny the 20th century was entirely mine? All of it, Kevin. All of it. Mine. I'm peeking, Kevin. Peeking. Now, the story is riveting partly because the devil is a fascinating villain. That brazen rule breaking is the whole point. And there's a timeless appeal there on display also in our politics lately. Obama campaign veteran and beat guest Jake Home and draws a clear line to Trump here, arguing that Pacino's devil and Trump both command attention because their flagrant over the top villainy is exciting. And there's a joy in transgressive behavior. You're having a great time while doing something you shouldn't. He notes that the mischief is then performed for all with even a sly smirk. We achieved more than anyone thought possible. Nobody thought we could even come close. I'm a surprise, Kevin. They don't see me coming. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. It's my time now. Somebody had to do it. I am the chosen one. Vanity is definitely my favorite sin. It goes beyond performance. There is actually something pretty modern about imagining the devil or the forces of evil that we would have to confront as a society or a democracy in the form of the litigator or the technocrat. Skilled lawyers can often deceive people without lying and shape perception while staying within technical lines. Now. In preparing this segment, we, as, a, as you saw, we talked to Che Comandora. He sees a parallel here, too. He says Pacino's Milton and Trump both relish showing off their skill. They break things legally for the most part. And he's right, even if you might think, gosh, hasn't Trump crossed the line? 
He is currently under investigation for breaking things illegally, and his time may come. But in many, many cases, from Mueller's mixed bag and obstruction to financial shenanigans, Donald Trump does two things that have helped his survival. One, he typically tests everything and goes over the line bit by bit, which means keeping track of knowing where the line is, and that means he's thinking ahead to complicate any potential case against him. He did back down from illegal plots like the military coup, as we reported. He demanded the DOJ interfere with vote counting, but then backed down on that as well. He has testified and folded when it was clear that, basically, he was going to face too much blowback. So he pushed way past where you're supposed to, but still backed off when he saw a criminal case over the horizon. I said two things, and here's the second, and it brings us back to the devil's advocate. Trump always, always deploys other people, deploys other people for the dirty work. He avoids leaving fingerprints like he avoids email. In just these past few years, we've seen two employees convicted and sentenced to prison for what they did for him. Right now, two other lawyers are facing possible indictment for the failed coup, again, an activity for Donald Trump. Now, it's striking and, I got to tell you, somewhat embarrassing for those lawyers, but many of Trump's lawyers are habitually in trouble, not because they're bad litigators in the sense of being incompetent or making mistakes, but because they get caught crossing lines for Trump. Like who you see on your screen, coup plotter John Eastman, searched by agents. It's the first time that's ever happened in his career after he started working for Trump. These are Trump's lawyers, his counsel, his advocates. Which brings us back to this devil's advocate. The profession of law faces these morals questions basically every day. How do you defend a guilty client? How do you draw a line between past conduct and future misconduct? How do you differentiate with ethics, if you can keep them, between zealous advocacy, which people are actually legally entitled to, and committing new crimes for a client which neither they are entitled to, to, nor is any lawyer allowed to do. That can get you indicted, and then you need a lawyer of your own. Komenduri also notes this theme is important in the film and today's democracy clashes. He says, mounting a strong defense for criminals is part of a fair civilization, but the legal profession contains the seeds of civilization's potential downfall. We see this in the defenses of Trump's behavior, both legal and political, he never seems to run out of devil's advocates. Now, in fiction, those advocates include an actual devil. This film is based on a book by Andrew Niederman, who says he decided to make the devil a top lawyer because in the modern world, that's where he thought the devil would operate most comfortably, taking either side, maneuvering. Now, Niederman's an author who follows politics closely, and he sees parallels to Trump in researching this report for you tonight, he actually told us in the film, there's this character of a rich New Yorker who basically gets away with murder by hiring the right attorneys. In the movie, they shot that character's home as the top four floors of 725 Fifth Avenue, which is Donald Trump's actual real gilded home you see here at Trump Tower. Now, that may sound like one more kind of surreal cultural overlap, but it's actually more than a coincidence about a movie, if you think about it. It also reflects the truth. The real Trump, pre-politics, was notoriously eager to cameo in just about any movie that he could get into, even with bit parts that made fun of him, or even touting a building he owned when he couldn't get himself on camera. Niederman explored that very theme as the downfall for some in his work. It is the theme of vanity, which some may also call a sin and can lead people who have it all to take seemingly wild risks and make seemingly inexplicable mistakes, which is how the devil's advocate ends its story with the devil seizing on his favorite sin. I'm terribly sorry but I can no longer represent my client. This is a story that needs to be told. It's you. You're a star. Baby. 
Call me in the morning. You got it. First thing. Bye, Larry. Vanity. Definitely my favorite sin. Vanity. You can use the word sin or shortcoming or moral failing. Whatever you think it is that drives people to make these type of mistakes, it is also the thing that we have seen tempt so many people past the path they initially chose in politics or public service into something much more terrible that we all have to live through. And that's why when we talk about the law and rules and morality and ethics, we're not just talking about boundaries as they are written down and handed down. We're talking about whether we as a society can hold together with what we believe to be good and the best for all over evil and the triumph of oppression by a very, very small few.